Thank you so much, ma'am. I think ma'am has very beautifully told us why we are here discussing on why do you need to think differently when it comes to treating a woman versus a man when it comes to diabetes or metabolic problems. So what, uh, like how she said, I'll talk about the, the adolescent and the reproductive, a young woman with type two diabetes. We're not talking about type one diabetes here because that's a completely different ball game. So let me start with this lady, this girl who comes to you in your OPD, a 16 year old school girl. She's come to you because she's been gaining weight and whatever she wants to do, she's just not able to lose weight. She's been trying and she's developed excess hair, hirsutism. So just these two things, what does it tell you? Does it ring a bell about something that you should just explore? PCOS, obviously, yes. So the first thing that you need to start thinking about is PCOS. So how do you want to evaluate here? Because this is what we're talking, evaluation and then management. So when it comes to, I will not go into the details of PCOS. This is not a lecture on PCOS, which is broadly, I'll give you an overview. So this is what should come, should come to your mind when you see somebody like this. Because we know PCOS has a variable presentation. So it could be just an incidental finding. She's gone for an ultrasound somewhere and you picked up polycystic ovaries and I'll come to the Rotterdam criteria for PCOS diagnosis in a little while. Or this could be some clinical manifestations that you see of hyperandrogenism. She may come with menstrual irregularity, probably an oligomenorrhea. Sometimes uh, women trying to conceive come to you with amenorrhea. So this is again where PCOS needs to ring a bell. Uh, so somebody who's seeking treatment for infertility, or like I said, somebody coming with excess hair, somebody coming with an androgenic male pattern of alopecia, somebody who's got excess acne. So this is where plus weight gain. So this is where, you know, I'm not talking about the lean PCOS here. So we're just talking in context of PCOS, what you should know. So when it starts with the evaluation, detailed history is very, very important in this you need to get a detailed medical history. Ask about the menstrual history because that will also guide you towards a diagnosis which can help in managing this girl. Look for other symptoms. She's just come with hirsutism and weight gain, but when she's sitting in front of you, look for some markers of insulin resistance. Does she have skin tags? Does she have acanthosis nigricans? Ask for uh, mood swings. Is she having mood swings? Depression, a very common association that you see with such disorders. Look for hair loss if she's got any. And then a family history, a detailed family history because we know there's always a meta, in metabolic disorders, you'll always find a link somewhere. So probably her mother has had PCOS or mother is type two diabetic, mother is obese or probably CVD in the family. So all these things you need to have a detailed family history. Once you've finished with the history and you've kind of gotten those red marks there, this is where you're looking at her. So a basic examination would be an anthropometry, which means the height, weight, BP, BMI, the basics, along with, of course, the waist hip ratio, which is very, very important in Asian Indians. And I don't need to go into the details for that. Evaluation for hirsutism, if that is a common presentation, the modified criteria that we have. So this is where that comes in. And like I said, the markers for insulin resistance you need to look for. Now, what are the investigations that you want to do for her? Of course, the basic biochemistry, LFT, KFT, CBC, all those things we always order. But something very that is very, very important to this diagnosis could probably be looking for a free testosterone level. We're looking for hyperandrogenism, a DHES level. And of course, thyroid profile to rule out whether there is any thyroid disorder in the background. And of course, the routine metabolic screening, which could be a fasting postprandial and NHBA1C just to look for pre-diabetes or an impaired glucose tolerance in her. Liver enzymes to kind of look for the association with fatty liver, which is a very common uh, presentation in such girls and largely goes unnoticed if we're not looking for it. And of course, a disturbed sleep commonly associated with weight gain, obesity, IGT metabolic syndrome, OSA is a common occurrence that you would probably see. So this is where you start that. And like I said, a diagnostic workup for PCOS would of course, the daughterdom criteria that I was talking of, at least two of the following three have to be present if you're going to label her as a PCOS. So there has to be probably a biochemical sign of androgen excess. This could be the free testosterone going up or an increased DHES. 
Ultrasound, of course, is very typical. You know, many a times you will see an ultrasound report where the, uh, where the radi radiologist just gives you a diagnosis of PCOS without actually fulfilling these criteria. So unless until in one or both the ovaries there is presence of at least 12 follicles, each of which is 2 to 9 millimeters in diameter with an eco-dense stroma and an or an ovarian volume which is more than 10, M 10 ml, that is where you give a radiological diagnosis of PCOS. Simply a polycystic echo texture is not a diagnosis for PCOS and you always need to have something adding on to that the way I talked to you about, about the clinical signs the way she's presenting. And then I'm not going into the management of PCOS of course, but for this girl you need to look at what is the presenting problem. Is she coming to you with a menstrual disorder? Is she coming to you for hirsutism? Of course you need to stress on the weight loss, the lifestyle, that is very, very important. And then comes the drug therapy, whether you want to give her metformin or not and all the other hormones. I'm not going into that because the idea is what should ring the bell when you see somebody like that sitting in front of you. This is how you evaluate a detailed history an examination, then you order the investigations which are specific to help you diagnose and then the presenting problems and how you want to manage that. So that's one part. Again, one very important point here is even if you picked up PCOS, besides all the other treatment, an important part is wa warning her about the impending risk of developing type 2 diabetes warning her about the future risk of gestational diabetes in pregnancy because we know PCOS is a very, very strong risk factor for women developing gestational diabetes once they get pregnant. So this is where right from adolescence you need to sensitize her to this risk and this is again where we discussed in the last uh, master class about the preconception counselling that comes into play. Of course, psychological well-being forms an important part and you need to be very sensitive to the mental health of the woman sitting in front of you and we'll discuss that in some time. So moving from her, we now have another woman, uh, Dimple, 31-year-old school teacher, already giving you a history of type 2 diabetes for five years. If you look at her, her biochemistry, this is the HbA1c. Currently, she's got an HbA1c of 7.4%. BMI on the higher side, 28.8%. And uh, something that's important is if you look at her drug chart, she's already on an STLT2 inhibitor along with metformin and aglimepiride. So she's on multiple OADs here, still with an HbA1c of 7.4. She is pretty active, 40 minutes daily walk, diet adherence is good, glucose levels are not on control. What is important is she's a young woman, 31 year old with type 2 diabetes on OADs. So how do you address her? Of course. The evaluation, of course, for any woman with diabetes, of course, this is something that is part of anybody with diabetes, a detailed history, the symptoms, the presentation, symptoms at onset of diagnosis, you need to know that, that treatment history, family history, medical history, we're not going into the details. So you, you do a complete um, history taking, followed by an examination, where again, I said the anthropometry is very important besides the physical examination and the systemic examination, including foot and eyes. Anybody with type 2 diabetes, remember to screen for neuropathy. Look at her foot at every visit if possible. Do something as simple as a VPT, something as simple as a 10 gram monofilament. And I, um, most of us who are associated with RSSDI, we're in the middle of a save the foot campaign. Save the foot, keep walking. So that is to create awareness on diabetic foot. So don't forget, even the patient will not come to you with a foot problem many a times. He may not even have developed it. But if you ask her for burning feet, ask her for paresthesias, so this is where it rings a bell for impending neuropathy as well. Plus, once a year, a retinal examination. Very important for anybody with type 2 diabetes, all across. Again, investigations, biochemistry, I think all of us know. And don't forget, like I said, screening for complications and comorbidities, which is very important. Now, coming to the management of this woman. She is in the reproductive age group. So what is very important is you need to ask her if she's completed the family or is she planning a pregnancy? Because this is where the management may change. Now, if this is somebody who is not planning a pregnancy, but since she is still in the reproductive age group, you need to warn her about the risk of an unplanned pregnancy if her HbA1c is not on target and if she is continuing on OADs and we've discussed preconception counseling in the last class so I'm not going to focus on that again. So 
you need to offer contraception also to this woman if she is not planning pregnancy since she is not on target HbA1c control. So that's very, very important. Of course, the BMI is on the higher side. So just don't write out a prescription for diabetes drugs and send her home. Counsel her on weight loss. Weight not needs to be addressed here again because that will have an impact on her glycemic control and need for medications as well. So weight loss with lifestyle, MNT, pharmacotherapy, take the pick. Depending on the patient, it has to be individualized. Again, when it comes to drug choices, if this lady is not planning a pregnancy, she's already on contraception, of course you can intensify with the whichever algorithm you want to follow. You have the ADA guidance, you have the ACE guidance, you have the RSSDI wheel for the Indian uh, patient with type 2 diabetic. So whichever guidance you follow, you can intensify with you know, an individualized patient-centric approach based on the financial status of the patient and the drugs that you want to give her. And of course, you need to address the comorbidities, complications. Again, an early screening for complications is very, very important. So microalbumin creatinine ratio, looking, for, uh, looking at the retina for any background retinopathy, doing a basic VPT or a 10 gram monofilament to address the microvascular complications and probably an ECG echo lipid profile, which would probably give you a little idea on the uh, cardiovascular impact as well. So CV risk assessment, very, very important. And of course, structured diabetes education. So a diabetes educator or whatever trained staff you have, that is an important component of managing type 2 diabetes for all your patients. Now, things change if this woman tells you that, yes, I am planning a pregnancy. Now, what do you do next? Because this is here again, like I said, Preconception counseling becomes very, very important. So this is where you need to tell her not to plan the pregnancy with an HbA1c of 7.4 at present. All the guidelines clearly tell you to aim for an HbA1c target of 6.5%. So besides the routine uh, checklist of preconception counseling that we talked about, starting folic acid is very, very important. I told you in my last presentation, the neural tube defects and the congenital anomalies, very, very common in an unplanned pregnancy if that happens with uncontrolled diabetes in the first trimester. So starting her on folic acid is very, very important. You need to continue till at least 12 weeks of pregnancy. Besides that, of course, like I said, a dilated eye examination because you know there will be a worsening of retinopathy if there is already a background retinopathy present. So then you need to screen for any background retinopathy. If you are picking up retinopathy, this is where you need to get an opinion because obviously there is a risk of retinopathy worsening. So you need to warn her on that and address that issue. Similarly, look at her renal profile, microalbumin creatinine ratio, something which is very, very important. And ACR has to be done. So all these profiles, all these things should be ringing a bell when she's sitting in front of you. So besides the routine preconception counseling, you need to understand, ask her, if she's planning the pregnancy, is she in an urgency to plan the pregnancy? So if you do not have time, this is the time to take her off the OADs and put her on insulin preconception itself so that you can get to target as early as possible. Once the glucose levels have been stabilized, the preconception targets are being met. That is where you allow her to conceive and proceed with the pregnancy. So this is where the drug therapy has to be very, very clearly boarding her, onboarding onto insulin as early as possible to address it. Of course, if she's in no hurry and she says there is time, you can probably intensify with orals, but warn her that whenever we want to start planning the pregnancy, this is where the orals need to be stopped because very clearly there is clear data that says none of the orals except of course metformin, which may be continued till 12 weeks in certain high risk women. Otherwise, the best is to onboard her onto insulin. If it is somebody with type 2 diabetes, probably a premix twice, you can onboard. Once she gets pregnant, then based on the SMBG, you can probably escalate her, intensify to a basal bolus regime to get the glucose levels on target. So with that, I think I'll end here and hand over to uh, Benny Ma'am.